here on VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English on The Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. Our program is designed for people learning English. Today on the show, we finish up the American story, The Murders in the Rue Morgue. And Alice Bryant brings us Ask a Teacher. But let's start with this report from Jonathan Evans. Myanmar's security forces are arresting thousands of people. Most are boys and young men. But many families of those taken do not know where they are. UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Agency, says it has reports of 1,000 cases of children or young people being arrested and jailed. Many do not have lawyers and cannot see their families. UNICEF says the majority of those taken are boys. The military has used arrests and imprisonment to make people afraid and to stop the pro-democracy movement in the country. Some are taken overnight and some in the middle of the day. People are taken from their homes or from the street. Some have been found dead. Many are imprisoned and sometimes tortured. Many more are missing. Me is a 27-year-old villager living in the northern area of Mandalay. She watched as children on motorbikes rode by her house toward the woods. Not long after, the village elders had a warning. All the boys must leave and get somewhere safe. The soldiers might be coming. The military's tactics are effective. In villages and cities, people watch for soldiers. They yell or bang on pots and pans to warn their neighbors if they are coming. I am more afraid of being arrested than getting shot, said one 29-year-old man. I have a chance of dying on the spot with just one shot, but being arrested, I am afraid that they would torture me. Since the military took control in February, the conflict in Myanmar has become much more violent. Security forces have killed more than 700 people, including a nine-year-old boy. The Assistance Association for Political Prisoners investigates deaths and arrests in Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. The group found that at least 3,500 people have been detained since military rule began. More than three-fourths of the people are men. Of the 419 men whose ages are known, almost two-thirds are under age 30, and 78 are teenagers. Pictures of people taken by the police have been seen online. In the pictures, there are signs of beatings and torture. The military's methods in showing the photos suggest it is trying to intimidate people. Kobo Chi is with the AAPP. He said, They think if they can kill off the boys and young men, then they can kill off the revolution. After receiving questions from the Associated Press, the military, known as the Tatmadaw, held a press conference on the video service Zoom. It called the AAPP a baseless organization. It denied the information was true and said security forces are not targeting young men. The security forces are not arresting based on genders and ages, said a military spokeswoman. They are only detaining anyone who is rioting, protesting, causing unrest. 
some of those taken by security forces were protesting. Some have connections to the political party that the military overthrew. Many are taken for no known reason. They are charged with making comments that cause fear or spread false news. Experts say both the military and police are responsible for the disappearances. Matthew Smith is the head of the human rights group Fortify Rights. He said there appeared to be some national-level communication and coordination taking place. Families are worried and trying to find information about their loved ones. Some have been sending food to the prisons. They hope if the food is not sent back, their relatives are still alive. Weinin Puentan is a Myanmar human rights activist. Her father was arrested during a 1988 protest against military rule. The family waited months before they learned he was in prison. I can't imagine families of young people who are 19, 20, 21 in prison," she said. "I'm trying to hold on to hope, but the situation is getting worse every day." I'm Jonathan Evans. New York State and city leaders. Have given permission to reopen Broadway theaters this fall at full capacity. Many Broadway productions are rushing to sell tickets in the coming days to reopen September 14th. They will be able to decide their own entry requirements, such as whether people must show proof of vaccination to attend a show. Charlotte St. Martin is president of the Broadway League. She said in a statement that the group's members are hopeful about Broadway's ability to resume performances this fall, and are happy that fans can start buying tickets again. Phantom of the Opera, Broadway's longest-running show, announced it planned to resume selling tickets for performances set to start October twenty-second. More shows are expected to announce return dates in the coming weeks. Mary McCall is executive director of Actors Equity Association, the national labor union representing more than fifty-one thousand actors and stage managers in live theater. She said the news meant the theater community is one step closer to the safe reopening of Broadway. The Broadway that reopens, however, will look different. In May, the big-budget Disney musical Frozen decided not to reopen when Broadway theaters restart. It was the first time the coronavirus pandemic caused the closing of an established show. Producers of the play Mean Girls also decided not to restart. But there will be new shows. One is Antoinette Chinonye Nwandu's Passover, which is set to reopen at the August Wilson Theater, the same theater Mean Girls left. And playwright Keenan Scott the Second's play, Thoughts of a Colored Man, will appear in a Schubert Theater. Theaters see the lifting of all capacity restrictions. As important to any reopening plan, that is because the economics of Broadway shows require full capacity. All city theaters suddenly closed on March twelfth, twenty twenty. Some shows planned for spring twenty twenty decided to move their productions to twenty twenty one. Among them are a musical about Michael Jackson, and a performance of Neil Simon's Plaza Suite. I'm Jill Robbins. The Girl Scouts organization, founded 
in 1912, is well known for teaching important life and survival skills to girls. Part of their goal, as stated on their website, is to improve their corner of the world. One way they do that has become a beloved tradition. They sell Girl Scout cookies. Many people look forward to Girl Scout cookie season and have a favorite cookie. Girl Scouts usually sell their cookies in person, door-to-door, -door, in offices and businesses, on busy street corners and sidewalks. But the coronavirus pandemic has made selling the cookies harder. There are simply less people out in public. Well, this year, in one U.S. state, some Girl Scouts will get around that face-to-face -face problem. Their cookies will be delivered by drones. Google is using drones to deliver Girl Scout cookies to people's homes in a Virginia community. The town of Christiansburg has been a testing ground for delivery drones. The tests are operated by Wing, a division of Google's corporate parent, Alphabet. Representatives from Wing told the Associated Press that the company began talking to local Girl Scout troops because of the pandemic. The troops have been having a harder time selling cookies during the pandemic because of restrictions. Gracie Walker is an 11-year-old with Girl Scouts of Virginia Skyline Troop 224. Gracie told the AP that she is excited to be part of history. She says the drones look like a helicopter, but also a plane. Wing drones fly without a human pilot controlling them remotely. When a drone reaches the home, it drops the delivery on the front lawn. Wing is also using the beloved Girl Scout cookies to build public support for drone delivery. The company is currently competing against Walmart, Amazon, and other businesses. However, there is not much evidence that people really want drone delivery services. Amazon has also been working on drone delivery for years. In 2013, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos said in a TV interview that drones would be flying to customers' homes within five years. However, that date has long since passed. A small study of people in Christiansburg appears to show that they are happy with the drones. But that study was done by researchers at nearby Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Also, Wing helped to pay for the study. Lee Vinzel is an assistant professor at Virginia Tech and did the study. He said that neighborhoods in the area are easiest for drone delivery. That might not be the case for more crowded places, he added. Federal officials started announcing new rules in early April. These new rules will allow operators to fly small drones over people and at night. Most drones will need to be equipped so they can be identified remotely by law enforcement officials. But all these problems have not lessened Grace's drone delivery excitement. The Virginia Girl Scout said she hopes that people are going to realize drones are better for the environment. And she adds people can also just walk outside in their pajamas and get cookies. 
I'm Ana Mateo. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Felipe in Brazil. He says, Hi, I'm from Baja do Piraí, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I have a little question. What is the difference between a magazine and a journal? Thanks. Hello, Felipe. There are several differences between these two kinds of publications. Magazines contain things like news, interviews, essays, how-to guides, pictures, and advertisements. Magazines are usually published weekly or monthly. They are aimed at the general public and use language that most of the public can easily understand. The articles are written by professional writers and reporters. Some are experts on the subjects they are writing about, but many are not. Suppose, for example, someone is writing a health-related story for a magazine. The person may gather information by speaking to health experts, reading about the subject on the Internet, and looking at study reports. They may even include information from press releases on the subject. That is very different from a journal. A journal is a publication aimed at researchers, academics, and experts in a professional field. Journals contain reports that describe original research and study findings. For example, a team of social scientists might study how COVID-19 has affected people's desire to spend time in groups. A team of insect experts might study how chemical products are affecting bees. One or more people from these teams then writes a report describing the study and its results. These reports contain formal language and technical terms known within a particular field. Most journal articles are also peer-reviewed. That means they are carefully examined by other researchers from a specific field before they are approved for publication. Most journals are published just a few times each year. There is something else called a trade journal. This is not the same as an academic journal. Trade journals are publications that promote education and skills within a specific trade or industry. And that's Ask a Teacher for this week. I'm Alice Bryant. The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe Part 5 I was stunned. Auguste Dupin my friend with the extraordinarily sharp mind and observational powers, still had surprises for me. He had uncovered so much about the horrifying Rue Morgue murders that it seemed there was more understanding than mystery left. But still, the major question remained, who Dupin had invited someone to our home. Someone he believed knew the answer to that question. As we awaited his arrival, my friend began to put together other pieces of evidence from the crime. We add for our consideration the condition of the room. So we have a strength more than human, a wildness less than human, a murder without reason, horror beyond human understanding, and finally, a voice without a recognizable language. A 
cold feeling went up and down my back. A madman, Dupin. Someone who has lost his mind. Only a madman could have done these murders. Dupin smiled a little. Ah, but madmen come from one country or another, don't they? Their cries may be terrible, but they are made of words, and some of the words can be understood. Let me help with one more clue. Look at this hair. I took it from the fingers of the old woman. Is this the hair of a madman? Dupin handed me the evidence. I could not believe what I was looking at, or the feel of it in my hands. Dupin, what is this? This hair is... This hair is not from a human at all. I described it only as hair. But also, look at this picture. It is a picture of the marks on the daughter's neck. The doctor said these marks were made by fingers. Let me spread the paper on the table before us. Try to put your fingers all at the same time on the picture so that your hand and its fingers will fit the picture of the marks on the daughter's neck. The marks left by the killer's hands were enormous. My fingers seemed like twigs in comparison. Dupin, these marks were made by no human hand. No, they were not. I am guessing they are from the hand of an orangutan. The size, strength, and wildness of these apes is well known. And the hair and strange sounds would complete the solution of killer animal as well. Yet, I still do not understand the second voice. We know it was a French-speaking man. His only words were, Mon Dieu. Who spoke, Dupin? Upon those two words, I have placed my hopes of finding a full solution to the crime. The, my God, was an expression of horror. It seems improbable that the speaker of those words helped the orangutan. Could he instead be its owner? Maybe the animal escaped from him, and he followed it to the house on the Rue Morgue. I assume that the man would not have been able to recapture it. Is that who we are waiting for now, Dupin? The Frenchman? How did you reach him? My friend smiled when he answered. I put an ad in the newspaper. Read it yourself. I took the newspaper. Caught early in the morning of the 7th of this month. A very large orangutan. The owner who is known to be a sailor, may have the animal again if he can prove it is his. But, Dupin, how can you know that the man is a sailor? I do not know it. I simply suspect. A sailor could go up that pole on the side of the house. Sailors travel to faraway lands where one might find an orangutan and it would be valuable. The sailor would want it back, so... Finally, Dupin, we learn the whole truth. Come in, my friend. Come in. Slowly, the door opened, and there, before us, stood a sailor. He spoke in French. Bonsoir. Good evening to you, too, my friend. I suppose you have come to ask about the orangutan. Yes. Is it here? No, no. We have no place for it here. If you can prove, it is yours. But of course I can. A shame. I wish I could keep it. It is very valuable, I guess. Well, I want it back, of course. I will pay you for your trouble to find it and keep it. What is your price? Well, that is very fair indeed, but it is not money I want, sir. My price is truth. 
Tell me everything you know about the murders in the Rue Morgue. The sailor's face reddened deeply. He jumped to his feet. For a moment, he stood and stared. But then he fell back into his chair, trembling. His face grew pale, his eyes closed, and he said not a word. Dupin then spoke softly. My friend, you must not be afraid. We are not going to hurt you. I know very well that you yourself are not the killer. But it is true that you know something about him, or about it. You've done nothing wrong. You didn't even take any of the money. You have no reason to be afraid to talk and to tell the truth. It is a matter of honor for you to tell all you know. So help me God. I... I'll tell you all I know. About a year ago, our ship sailed to the far east, to the island of Borneo. The forest there, the jungle, was thick with trees and other plants, and hot and wet and dark. My friend and I wanted to explore the strange place, so we did. There we saw the orangutan and caught it, and it returned with us to the ship. My friend died on the passage home, so the animal became mine alone. I was keeping it in a cage in my house here in Paris. I planned to sell it very soon. One night, I came home, and it was... It was loose. It had got free. I don't know how. It held a knife in its hands. It did not know of its dangers, of course. It was playing with it. As soon as the animal saw me, it jumped up and ran from the house. I followed. It ran several blocks and turned a corner. When I made the same turn, the animal was out of sight. I looked far down the street and saw nothing. Then I heard a noise above me. There was the beast, climbing a pole up the side of a house. It was maybe two meters up. I also went up the pole. As I am a sailor, it was easy for me. When the animal was close to the top, I saw him jump through an open window. I got to the same place, but could not make the jump. I could see into the room, however, through another window, which was closed. The two women were sitting there, looking at papers from a box on the floor. The animal, knife still in hand, made a noise, and the old woman turned. That is when I heard the first of those terrible cries. I watched with horror as the animal attacked. Soon the two were dead, and the room was a disaster. The orangutan then pushed the young woman's body up the chimney. It picked up the other victim then and moved toward the window. I realized what was coming and I fled. Down the pipe I scrambled. At the bottom, I heard the old woman's body hit the ground. I ran. I didn't look back. I ran. Oh, mon Dieu, mon Dieu. The police in Paris could not charge the sailor. His only wrongdoing was silence, which is not a criminal offense, the police chief said. However, the official did have a problem with Dupin. He was angry that Dupin, and not a member of his force, had solved the mystery. He said people should mind their own business. Let him complain. He'll feel better for it, and maybe learn something. Perhaps he will never again say not possible about that which, somehow must be possible. And that is our show for today. I'm Katie Weaver. Thanks for listening.